So we're going to be talking about, over the next seven weeks, seven conversations you should have with God. That doesn't mean that there are not many more conversations you need to have with God, but we're going to highlight seven of these conversations that each one of us should have with God in life. This morning, we're going to begin with one of those conversations that is absolutely applicable to every person here today. We're going to ask you from Psalm 139 to have a conversation with God about your significance, your significance. Now, your significance means that you have self-worth, that you're worth something. And God in His Word, in Psalm 139, talks about how much you are worth. I believe the year was 1987 when a very popular book was released called The Search for Significance. It was read by thousands upon thousands upon thousands of evangelical believers. It was a book that talked about your self-worth from a biblical perspective. The writer, the author, was Dr. Robert S. McGee. And McGee said that there are two possible ways that we gain our self-worth, two possible ways that we encounter this element of significance. The first way, he called it the world system. The world system. This world system's been around ever since the Garden of Eden, by the way. It's where you would gain your self-worth by two basic things. You take your performance, and you add that to what others say about you, what others think about you, what others write about you, and therein results in your self-worth. Now, that's very, very dangerous when you determine your self-worth based off your performance, based off of what you do. I mean, what happens if you don't reach all your goals? Are you not worth anything? What happens if you wake up and you're 40 years of age and you're not already in the job that you felt you ought to be in by the time you're 40 years of age? I mean, what happens when you wake up and you're 90 and you haven't achieved your goals? Does that mean that you're worthless? Or does that mean that God had a different route for you than which you ever had for yourself? He also said there's another way, and obviously this is the best way, and that is God's way, God's system, that you find your self-worth in God's truth that God says about you. Now, I want you to understand, ever since the creation, the early creation of Adam and Eve, God's system has been there that you gain worth through Him. I mean, how much more worth can you have than God telling you, you're made in my image? That's a lot better than Adam and Eve being in the Garden of Eden, God telling them not to do one thing, and they ended up doing it. You follow what I'm saying? Well, sometimes we need to stop long enough and we need to have a conversation with God. I thought the early morning what it's like when you have your children growing up and all of a sudden you have grandchildren. Now, it's a wonderful experience. Those of you that don't know what it's like, one day you're going to know and they're called grandchildren for a reason. They are a lot better than the ones you had. (laughs) And in all that response is, what you find out is that when you're in the middle of that, you know how difficult it is once you have grandchildren to have an intelligent, ongoing, long conversation if they're still awake? And you wanted to have a child or a conversation with your child who's now an adult, and you wanted to have a serious conversation with them? You can't do that when those kids are awake because they're taking you and they're saying, hey, turn your head this way. All right, they're over here fighting each other, entertaining one another, 
the latest crisis goes on and you feel like you're a referee in the room. Flag, penalty on you. It's a little hard. And then by the time they finally wear out and your kids go, whew, and you think you're going to have an intelligent conversation with them, they're worn out. They don't want to talk. Understandable. You see, this is exactly the way it is with us in life. We're so distracted by the things around us, it is not very often that we pull up a chair or we get on our knees or we pause long enough to have an intelligent conversation with God. There's nothing more important than a one-on-one conversation with someone you love. We know that in the 139th chapter of the book of Psalm, that's exactly what God did. God had a conversation with one of his men. He was a king. He knew what it was like to achieve. He also knew what it was like to fail. You see, there's a real commonality here today. Doesn't matter whether you're a teenager or you're a senior adult, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a CEO or you have a private company or you serve this region in some capacity of the workforce. Doesn't matter whether you're an athlete or you're in the band. I want to share you today that every one of us deal with this issue of self-worth. You take the most highly recognized individual in this room whom you would say is the most successful of the most successful, and I can tell you they have issues about their own personal insecurities. It's the way we are. Parents, I want to give you something in a moment that you need to remember. You need to try to memorize, and you need to teach it to your children. And here it is. You tell your child that their significance, their self-worth, does not come from their performance and what others say about them, but from God himself and what his truth is says about them. You see, it's so important that one of the most personal conversations you should have with God in your life is what God says about you and about your own self-worth. It doesn't matter whether you teach in children or preschool, whether you minister through our student ministry or our collegiate ministry, Young adults, or you take care of the older folks in our, in our church. I can assure you that every one of us need to know what I'm about to tell you today in Psalm 139. But I understand it's Sunday. Some of you, 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 you wear out during the week. By the time you come to Sunday, you're just glad you don't have to deal with the kids in the auditorium if they're, here, if they're not here. You're glad you get to pause for a moment, and while you want to dial in, sometimes there's just something about it you don't dial in. Now, that's not good, but I realize that's reality. So if that's where you are today and you don't remember anything else I say, would you do me a favor and try to remember these words? You matter to God. You are important to God. You are significant. You matter to God. People need to know they matter to God. And you are important to God. People need to know that they're important to God. And they need to know that they have self-worth. Parents, always tell your kids that. When my children were growing up in our home, and I do it with our grandchildren, I tell them, I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you, even when they're not worthy at times for anyone to believe in them. I believe in you. But see, they're worthy not based off their performance, but based off of what God says about them. They're always worthy. This morning, I want to teach you Psalm 139, and I want to do it from 
are in the first person. And so as we do that today, I want to talk about why I am significant. You say, wow, you got a pretty big ego. Well, I probably do, and I really work on that, and God makes sure I work on that along the way. But this is really about you, too, because you see, if you were up here, you could say the same thing. I am significant because you are significant because. But what does Psalm 139 teach me? I am significant because God knows everything about me. That's the first of four things that we learn here in God's Word out of 139. That I matter to God and I have self-worth because God knows everything about me. Psalm 139, would you please look at it with me? I'll be reading it from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Get it on your e-device. I hope you bring a copy of God's Word with you, a written copy. But regardless of where you are or you got it memorized, you dial it up, 139 verse 1. You have searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. And this extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. I am able to understand it. It's difficult. It's incomprehensible for me. Verse 1 tells me this about God knowing everything about me. God gets me. He gets me. Do you understand that? I got people all the time. They don't get me. They don't, they don't get me. They don't get you either, so don't be pointing your finger here. And see, he gets me because he knows everything about me. I've been married almost 39 years, Lord Jesus. And she still don't get me. But I want to make it real clear. I don't get her either. Can I get an amen from the brotherhood? We don't always get each other, but God gets us. Verse 2 says, God knows when I sit, and God knows when I stand. Wow! He discerns all my thoughts. That's scary. Next time you have a bad thought, you remember God already, he already heard that. He already, he already got it. He discerns my thoughts. He knows my travels. He knows where I go. He knows when I rest. God is aware of all my ways. I mean, what a powerful thought. Some of you get on a plane every Sunday afternoon or Monday morning and you're not back till Friday. Some of you are not back till Saturday. I see some of you in the airport. I'm all over the place these days. And I'm glad to know that God knows everything about me when I am. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse 5, he is in front of me, he is behind me. He is in control of me. What a powerful thought that God knows so much about that. In fact, when David started articulating this to God, the Bible says in verse 6 that he said, I am overwhelmed with the wonder of how God is all knowledgeable about me and how God is with me. In other words, my God is beyond my comprehension. I want to tell you today, God says you matter to Him. You are important to God. You have self-worth to God. Not because of something you do or something you don't do, but because of what God says about you. And God knows everything about you. Everything. I cannot hide from Him. I'm significant today also because God is always with me. He's always with me. Verse 7 through verse 12. Read it with me. Where can I go to escape your spirit? That's a question. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. 
If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live in the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God is always with me. God has been wherever I've been. God has been wherever you've been. Some of you say, man, I've been to places. I'm not sure God's there. Oh, God's been there, and he's there. God is not restrained by time and space. He has nothing like us. I mean, God is there. He's in New York City. He's in San Francisco. He's in Tokyo. He's over there in Malawi. He's there in Moscow. He's over here in Pea Ridge. He's here. You've never been anywhere that God hadn't been. He's in heaven. And the Bible says in verse number eight, he even has access to the underworld to Sheol. Verse 9 says, wherever I go or wherever I live, God is there. If God sends me to the east, he's there. If God sends me to the west, he's there. Some of you got sent here. You're not sure. He's here. That's right. He's here. Doesn't matter whether you go to the north or you go to the south, God is there. You see, verse 10 tells us you ha- God has no limits. He has no limits. He, he can lead me. He can hold on to me. His protection and his authority, they know no limits at all. I'm telling you, God is always with me. The scripture goes on to say that David said that evil people cannot hide from God. And they cannot hide their deeds from God. And it doesn't matter how dark it is that we try to go. Guess what? Those deeds are made real. In fact, he is such a bright light that he can even penetrate the light of the day with his presence. And you know, I'm so grateful that God is there. Man, when I think about the, the, where, where I've got to be in my life, I mean, I'm on a plane a lot these days. I'm... I'm I'm driving some, being driven some, and it's dangerous any time I drive. But I mean, I'm I'm glad to know God is with me through my travels, including today. I'm going to be speaking 15 times in seven different states over the next nine days, and if the planes don't work, I'm in trouble. If the cars don't work, I'm in trouble. But I'm telling you, whether it works or it doesn't work, I'm glad to know that God is always with me and that he is traveling me. He knows where I am. And I'm so worth so much to him that he does that. The same is true for you. I want to tell you today, I don't know what you're facing, but I want you to know God is with you. Good, bad, ugly, sorrow, pain, loss, God is always with you. And you have self-worth because God created me. We read in verse 13 through 16 that God created me. I have a word for you today, and I, I don't know all who is in this room. I never do. I certainly don't know who watches this on television or who live streams us around the world. But in all humility, I want to say to every one of you who might believe in abortion or you do believe in abortion, if you believe in the killing of the unborn, if you believe in the actions of Planned Parenthood or you support them in any way, I want to tell you that Psalm 139 is for you. It defies in the name of God, the God of Israel and the God who raised Jesus from the dead. 
It defies what this world tells you about human life. And you listen to what God says. For it was you, David declared to God, it was you who created my inward parts. Listen to me. God has always created the inward parts. He's always been there even before the creation. At the very moment of conception, God has always been there. Even before you were formed, God was there. And some of us are so amazed today at what we're learning through an ultrasound or whatever it may be that helps a woman or a man to know the viability of life that's been given to their marriage or to a woman whose life is in her womb. Listen, science is just catching up with what God has said all along. And what do we know now? We know that something is living in the womb of that mama. God has said all along something's living in the womb of that mama. It's human life. And listen to what he says in verse 13. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Verse 13, God says, you just didn't happen. Some of you have been taught that in schools all over America and the world. Well, you just happened. No, you didn't. God created you. And the inward parts of you means your the feet, the, excuse me, the seed of your the seed of your emotion, the seed of your emotions and your will. Even God created that. And that when you were in your mother's womb, God formed you. He formed you, intricately formed you. In fact, David became so overwhelmed by this in verse 14. He said, "I I give God praise in my life because I have been wonderfully made." I am set apart by God. I, there is no one like me. There is not another Ronnie Floyd anywhere. And all of God's people said, amen. There's not one of you either, bozo. You know it and I know it. I mean, you are remarkably, uniquely, and wonderfully made in the eyes of God. It's hard to believe that God took me and he wove me into existence. And you see, God doesn't make mistakes. All God does is wonderful. That's why you need to be real careful ever making fun of any human creation God has put on this earth. Doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter any deformity or unique part of the image that they have. You see, when I was in the womb of my mom and you were in the womb of your mom, nothing was hidden from God. And even before you had any actual form, verse 16 says that in the very initial moments of creation, God ordained your life. God ordained your details. And listen to what it says God knows. God knows the number of your days on this earth. At that point, and God knows the details of each day of your life. My goodness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, it says, but even the hairs of your head have all been counted, so don't be afraid. The issue there is not how much hair you got on your head or how much you don't have. The issue is that God is so involved in your life, he determined the hairs on your head, and therefore there's no reason for you to be afraid. He's got you. He gets you. He's for you. God has created you, and he knows the days of your life in detail, and you need to listen to what he says about it and live your life by it because he said in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach me to number my days. How? Carefully. So... 
that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. God is saying you use your time wisely in your life when you know that God has been so intricately and significantly involved in your creation. This world will tell you that you find your own wisdom and you have your wisdom through your own autonomy. Hogwash. That you have your wisdom and your own choices. Hogwash. In your own ways. Hogwash. I don't care whether you hear it from corporate America to the school classroom or through governmental authority. Hogwash. You have wisdom, David says, by understanding God is sovereign over all affairs in your life and in control of everything, and you trust what he does. That's what he says. And that's because, that's because there's something else that brings you a major understanding of your significance. God thinks about me. God thinks about me. He thinks about you. He said, man, he must not be very busy. Oh, no, he thinks about you. Verse 17 and verse 18, such a powerful word. God, how difficult your thoughts are for me to comprehend how vast their sum is. Now, what has he been talking about with David? David's been learning that God knows everything about him, that God is always with him, and that God has created him. And now listen to what he is saying. Lord, it's hard for me to understand that. Those words, it's, I can't even comprehend the sum of those words. If I even counted all this stuff you've said about me, uh, they would outnumber the grains of sand when I wake up and I'm still with you. I'm telling you today, God's mind and his thoughts about you are incomprehensible. No one may think about you. You may get offended that other people at the work don't think about you, or your boss doesn't think about you, or your wife or your husband doesn't think about you, or your mother-in-law doesn't think about you. Some of you say, well, I'm glad she doesn't. No, but at least she does. I want to tell you, it's none of that. You know what it is? God thinks about you. God is unlimited. We're limited. God is unlimited. Completely unlimited by time or space. And he says, if I counted God's thoughts about me, they would be innumerable just as the sand on the seashore. My soul, have you ever seen the sand on the seashore? Gina and I have been on all kinds of seashores around this world. One of my favorite places to be is on a beach. I like being on the beach. When I think about the beach and I talk about the beach right now, I'm already feeling better about myself. There's something powerful about that. I'm reminded oftentimes when I go about my sin. Because you remember what the scripture says? That God takes your sin and he throws it in the bottom of the sea. Isn't that a wonderful imagery? Can't wait till I go to be with my grandkids again. I like for them to go to the beach with us some. <laughs> and during those good moments of them being at the beach, I like walking down the shore, collecting seashells, or just listening to their conversation, trying to keep up with them and them doing something. Can't wait till I go again because I have a new exercise for them since I read this passage. I'm going to get one grain of sand, just one. Hard to get one grain of sand in your finger. I'm going to put it on my finger, and I'm going to tell them, look at that right there. That's a grain of sand, and that makes up all this thing we call the beach, all the sand on the beach. And I want to say to them, listen, look to your left, look to your right. And they're looking. Now, let's guess how many of those grains there are. How many of these are on this, on this shore? And I'm telling you, Gina and I talked about it on the way up here. We could almost articulate every one of their responses of the seven. 
especially those obviously who can respond. It's a little hard to get Maya along the way right now. She's like eight months. Isn't that right? Like I said, nine months. <laughs> but, but, but I'm telling you, I know. The, and of all those, I guarantee you, we'd have one. He would know. And then he would laugh and say, I don't know. Making fun of himself or making fun of everybody else. But I'm going to tell him to listen. If you were to count all the grains on this seashore, God even thinks more about you than how many grains are on this seashore. Children, adults, young to old, they need to know God thinks about them. And that's what God loves you and God thinks about you. Isn't that incredible? Because sometimes when the kids don't call, you wonder if they think about you. Or if somebody doesn't recognize something you've done, you wonder if they think about you. But here's what Psalm 139 tells us and how powerful it is. It tells us that we are significant because God knows everything about me. Because God is always for me and God created me and God thinks about me. And then listen to what it says. Because God knows all that and does all that. God, deal with your enemies. Deal with your enemies. That's what David declared. God, since you know all this stuff, you know the evil of your enemies. Deal with your enemies. Look at it with me in the scripture. Verse 19. God, if only you would kill the wicked. You bloodthirsty men, stay away from me who invoke you deceitfully. Your enemies swear by you falsely. Lord, don't I hate those who hate you and detest those who rebel against you? I hate them with extreme hatred. I consider them my enemies. God, deal with your enemies. Judge all of your enemies. Because of who you are and all that you've done. And here you are. You've done all this for us. And yet they rebel against you. They scoff at you. Deal with your enemies. There are some in this room today. You may have an enemy. You may know in this culture there's a lot of enemies of God today. And they're no longer hiding under anywhere. They're they're pretty visible and pretty vocal. Listen, God will deal with them. Let God deal with them. And even with your own enemies, release them and let God deal with them. But he doesn't stop there. He says, God, based off of all that, would you deal with me? Would you deal with me? Look at those verses in verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Now, why would he tell God that? Because he now knows that God knows everything about him. God thinks about him. There's nowhere he can hide from him. God, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns and see if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. David declares that he does not understand all of God's ability, but he does know that God is able to take him and examine him to the core, if you may. God can scrutinize my heart. God knows everything about me. I cannot hide from God. I cannot run far enough away from God to get away from God. God knows everything about me. God knows my pain. God knows my hardship. God knows the good things in my life. God knows me personally, David says. And because God knows me, I need you to reveal all to me what's not right in my life. And I want you to lead me, God. And I want you to guide me, God. And I want you to usher me into your eternal presence one day, God. And that's what he wanted. And I can assure you, he understood. Why did he understand? I close with this phrase today. Beginning at conception, God is with you. And he will see you through. Did you hear me? He will see you through. Even through your way to death. God will see you 
through. Now think about that with me for a moment. God knows all about you and is there even when you were formless and you were conceived. He stays with you all through life. And he leads you, ushers you into the eternal presence of God if you know his son. Four years ago, my mom died. It was just last month. She had leukemia. And it really took her fast. My mom was a strong woman. Strong woman. She, she, she even mowed the lawn some when she was on chemotherapy. She's a hoss. And, uh, but I'm telling you, mom, when she couldn't do anything and she was in her final hours, Gina and I were there. I, I, I don't know what happened the final 30 minutes before my mom died. But I can tell you something happened. I, I don't know what it was. But to some degree, I believe I know what it was. I can't prove it. But all I know is the last 30 minutes of my mom's life on this earth, things changed. She must have seen something or she must have known something. Because I'm telling you, she's so changed, expressions changed, and if she could have gotten out of that bed and literally leaped to heaven, something was clicking with mom that I'd never seen before. I believe, and again, I can't prove this. But I believe God was there to usher my mom into the eternal presence of God. Because he was with her in conception. He was with her through life. And even through her death, he led her into the everlasting. That's what David prayed for. That's a pretty important conversation to have with God, don't you think? But I can assure you, there's not a more important conversation with God than a conversation that goes something like this. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm not being what you want me to be. And I believe Jesus died for me. And I believe he was raised from the dead for me. And I turned from my sin today. And I opened my heart to receive the forgiveness, the cleansing of all of my sin. Come into my life, Jesus. Give me meaning, purpose, significance. And don't ever leave me. And give me eternal life when I die. That is the most important conversation. And the only way Psalm 139 makes sense is when that makes sense. Because he comes into your life never to leave you nor ever to forsake you.